I did go keto for eight weeks <laughs> and I lost so much weight. It's, um, it's pretty crazy. It bounced straight back, of course. Of course. Yeah. Because you mostly lost water. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, That's one of the problems with m many diets. The keto diet and fasting, they, someone said to me the other day that keto is basically a form of fasting in a way. Um, and are they, how do they help the body? Because people are pretty crazy and pretty keen on both fasting at the moment, but also the ketogenic diet. Well, fasting is when you go into negative energy balance, right? Which is how we spent most of our sort of evolutionary history, right? Well, you, how you spend part of every day, right? We, we eat. <laughs> well, after you eat, you're in positive energy balance. Mm -hmm. And then when you, in between meals, your energy balance goes down, right? Now you're, in neg you're burning now energy that you've stored. When you're asleep, you're in negative energy balance. So fasting is just a prolonged state of negative energy balance, right? Does that mean that it would, it would reduce my chance of getting cancer? Could do. People are, are hoping that's the case. I don't know how good the data are for intermittent fasting. Um, because if the surplus in energy causes cancer, then me being in that negative energy balance presumably will reduce my chances of getting these. Right, but then you have to go back into positive energy balance at some point too, right? You can't keep up negative energy balance. So intermittent fasting isn't necessarily a, a way to lose weight if you eventually, you know, replace those calories, right? So what you, so here's a hypothesis, right? To which I cannot, um, I cannot prove, but I think that you know when you. When you exercise, right, you're also going to negative energy balance because you're burning energy. You're not eating while you're exercising. At least most people aren't, right? And and your and your body's turn, you know, turning on all kinds of mechanisms to to um, to cope with that negative energy balance. You're turning on all kinds of repair and maintenance mechanisms. When you when you when you go through intermittent fasting, you're basically doing the same thing, but less acutely. It's it's a more gradual level, and I and if you look at the at the at the genes that are turned on by exercise, and the genes that are turned on by intermittent fasting, many of them are the, very much the same. And I think it's because you're basically turning on genes that are responding to that negative energy balance. Um, but um, but I would argue that you're going to get more of a bang for your buck by exercising than just going through intermittent fasting. Or both. Well, a bit too much. <laughs> yeah, I mean, intermittent fasting might be a kind of a easy way to get some of the benefits of exercise without exercising. It might be. I mean, obviously we went, we, you know, there's nothing necessarily wrong with intermittent fasting, but I'm not sure that it has some of the huge benefits that people claim. Now, keto diets are a little different, right? So keto diets are when you're, you're basically avoiding any carbohydrates. And carbohydrates, the, the basic building block of most sugars is, is glucose, right? Mm -hmm. Glucose is the sort of a simple form of sugar that are basically in starches. There, there's some other sugars. Fructose is also, which is the kind of the sweet one. But when you basically stop taking in glucose, right, you're now basically taking in only fats. And, and so instead of using glucose to fuel your brain and, and other cells in your body, you're now using what's called ketone bodies. These are, these are essentially, remember we talked about how you, when you break those fats down into small little units, those are ketone bodies. Uh, they um, they can be used as energy, but um, but they're more of a kind of a backup energy source for our bodies than than the primary energy source. So we we use them. Um, we tend our bodies tend to use them when we don't have glucose available to us. And does that mean the same sort of re repair and restore mechanism kicks in potentially? No, I don't think so because no. that's not negative energy balance. You're just using an alternative fuel in this particular point. Because a lot of doctors have sort of prescribed a keto diet for people that have like epilepsy seizures. Right. And I don't think anybody knows, I'm not a neurologist, yeah. but I don't think anybody knows why key, key, uh, key, high ketone diets are so uh, beneficial for epilepsy, but it could be that they do. And I just don't know. And I'm, I, it's, that's not my, it's not my subject. But anyway, there's a, there's a, there's a thought that if you just, you know, essentially keep your insulin levels low and rely on ketone bodies instead of glucose, you can, you know, do all kinds of miraculous things. Um, for weight loss, if you look at the data, yes, it does tend to uh, lead to rapid short-term weight loss, but the data don't don't show it is very effective as a long-term weight loss strategy. And I think your your example, your own anecdotal account is is sort of typical. You said you're writing a book about diet and food. Yes. Why? The story of how the diets that we eat today and and uh, is a, is actually a really fascinating story, but also um, because I think that we, um, if we take a, a more evolutionary approach to diet, um, we can, I think, do much better to thinking about, you know, uh, help people make choices. I mean, 
one important point to make is that, you know, today, like when we fin finish this interview, I'm going to go home and my wife and I are going to, and my daughter and my mother-in-law are going to try to decide what we're going to have for dinner tonight. Right. And we can like, we can go, we can eat whatever we want. Right. We can go to the supermarket and there's like, you name it right here in New York. There really is, you name it. Right. We can, we can go out to restaurants. We can have Chinese or food or Japanese food or American food or French food, whatever. Right. We have we have incredible choices to us. For most of human evolutionary history, people never chose what they ate ever, right? They ate what was available to them. And now with all this choice, we comes, comes, comes bad choices, right? And so uh, I would like to help people figure out how not only realize that these choices that we have to make are, we're not really evolved to do, but also how to better understand what those choices are and what the complexities are of of them because there are no there, there's no such thing as a free lunch right every every choice that you make has alternatives and alternative consequences and and i think people oversimplify diet people come up with simple ideas you know just do this just be a vegan just be a this just be a that um there are no perfect answers do you think in some ways that our culture moved so much faster than our biology in a sense because we're like super sedentary now we just sit all day we have these screens that bring us our food um, the food is processed. And is this part of what's causing this sort of misalignment, all these mis mismatched diseases, as you call them, is? Absolutely, because evolution by natural selection occurs really slowly, right? Every generation, people with genes that have given them adaptations, they're better able to handle a particular environmental context, do better than the next generation. So slowly, 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 generation by generation, you get change, right? And that's true for every animal, right? Um, all, mismatch is not unique to humans, right? As environments change, some animals are better adapted to that environment than other animals, and though those animals are going to be more likely to pass those genes on to their offspring. So mismatches are part of a natural selection. Every species, as environments change, is subject to mismatch, or as they move into new environments. The difference with humans is that we have culture. And culture has caused an acceleration of environmental change, right? Think about, I mean, just today, right? I have now a, in my pocket a, a computer, right? That I didn't have a few, you know, decades ago, right? Um, we have internet and email and all kinds of things, right? Our, our, just the last few decades, the world has changed amazingly. Just think about the last few generations, the last few hundred years, the last few thousand years. So cultural evolution is so powerful and so rapid. It's so fast. It's so transformative that we have m made our world so vastly and rapidly different that our bodies cannot possibly keep up. If you love the Diary of a CEO brand and you watch this channel, please do me a huge favor, become part of the 15% of the viewers on this channel that have hit the subscribe button. It helps us tremendously and the bigger the channel gets, the bigger the guests.